Here, in the middle of the Amazon rainforest in French Guiana, my field assistant Kati and I start each day with a steep ascent in heavy tropical humidity. The sweat pays off with a view few people get to see in person. Untouched rainforests spreading out before us. It's not just a pleasant, solitary hike we're after. And we're not really alone. Many animals inhabit the rocky outcropping, making their homes, feeding, mating and breeding. We are up here because the plateau is home to many bromeliads, flowering plants whose leaves form a vase-like structure that collects water. These plants serve as shelters and mating grounds for various species. We are after one in particular. The variable poison frog, or Aranitomia variabilis, is a tiny, striking amphibian. Like other members of the dendrobated family, usually referred to as poison frogs, they are brightly colored, or aposematic, broadcasting their toxicity to potential predators. And, like other poison frogs, these amphibians actually take care of their young. It starts with mating. The male calls to the female, trying to prove his attractiveness and getting the female to follow him. This usually requires some effort and the male is often left unsuccessful. However, once he can convince her, the female lays eggs and the male fertilizes them. These eggs are left right here in the bromeliad. The tadpoles develop in the jelly-like eggs over two weeks. During this time, the dad returns regularly to check in on them. When the tadpoles are old enough to feed on their own, the father takes another step. He helps the tadpoles to escape from the viscous jelly so they can wiggle onto his back. Sometimes this is easier said than done, but eventually parent and offspring manage. Once the tadpoles are on his back, the male transports the tadpoles, navigating terrain and avoiding potential predators. This piggyback ride is more than just a method of transportation. In previous experiments, we found that microbiota from the adult frog are transmitted to the tadpoles during this close skin contact. As in other species, this transfer of microbiota, scientifically referred to as vertical transmission, can shape the newborn's immune system and impact lifelong fitness and pathogen defense. Once the dad reaches a bromeliad water pool that his inspection reveals is safe and suitable, the male can deposit the tadpole. Though he may carry multiple on his back simultaneously, he tries to only deposit one at a time, for being housed together may result in cannibalism. The tadpole makes an effort to wriggle off and swim into its new home. It will grow up in this leafy enclosure, slowly growing limbs and losing its tail until it has completed metamorphosis and is a little froglet. This year, I want to understand how growing tadpoles communicate their presence to transporting frogs to avoid getting a cannibalistic roommate. For this purpose, Katya and I have set up security cameras to monitor the bromeliad waterholes that contain tadpoles. The cameras are motion activated, so when parent frogs visit, the camera records some footage. The cameras are powered by heavy power banks, which we must waterproof and trade out every other day to charge. 
We also get our weather data on these little loggers to better understand the conditions under which we make our observations. In some bromeliads where depositions have occurred, we have replaced the tadpole with realistic models. We want to find out if an object visually identical to a tadpole is enough to deter the parent from depositing in the same nursery, or if tadpoles must communicate through motion. Down below, the rainforest houses a different, equally intriguing group of animals. We are based out of a research station nestled at the foot of the small mountain we climb each day. The station is also home to some non-human residents who find shelter and food in the man-made structures. We continue our work here, analyzing data and reviewing gathered materials. Cut these sorts through the footage from the video cameras, noting exciting activities. Like a normal camera trap that might record larger animals, these cameras show the diverse community that resides among the bromeliads. As might be expected in a tropical rainforest, the precipitation can come down hard in torrential downpours. However, despite appearances, it might not be enough. Whether it is annual variation or the effects of climate change, fluctuations in weather patterns have led to drier conditions and higher temperatures for the frogs in recent years. Like scientists everywhere, we are measuring the potential impacts of climate change. Two years ago, on a three-month trip, I monitored more than 90 frogs and 184 tadpoles on the mountain top. This year, over six weeks, we found approximately 20 frogs and 48 tadpoles. Some areas that previously held many frogs and tadpoles no longer have any. Days go by without depositions and with few frog sightings as the sun beats down on the plateau. With less water, it is harder for frogs to mate, move around with their tadpoles and find places to deposit them. Couple that with predation from more resilient hunters, like dragonfly larvae, and the situation is more dire. Mm, those are actually good bromeliads, but they are empty. And, um, it is unclear if this is a reversible trend and if there will be years of plentiful rain to replenish the population. This year, it does not look good. After six weeks, our trip is over. We head down for the last time this year, having collected less data than expected due to the reduced numbers of active frogs and tadpoles. The animals stick around on their home, facing the usual challenges of survival. The next few years will reveal more about how their habitat is changing and whether they will be able to adapt to new conditions. <laughs> 